Hi, this is Professor Dorr, and this is lecture number one of EE310 at San Diego State University. In this class, we use Alexander and Sadaku's Fundamentals of Electric Circuits textbook. This is just an excellent textbook, and we cover chapters 8, 9, 10, 11, 14, 15, and 16. Topics include second order circuits, or thuds and boings as I call them, AC circuit analysis, mutual inductance and transformers, frequency response, and Laplace transforms. Before we get started, I should introduce Bella because you're probably going to see a lot of Bella in these lectures. Bella is 13 years old and she's half feral, so on the one hand, she doesn't like to be held, and she always claws me when I let her go. But on the other hand, she bugs me incessantly as I'm doing these lectures. I think she's talking, she thinks I'm talking to her. So sometimes she'll bug me so much that I might have to just pick her up. So say hi to everybody, Bella. Don't interrupt my class too much. Ouch, that hurts. Okay, so please read the syllabus carefully because it's gonna provide you all the details for the course. And if you have any questions on the syllabus, let's make sure to discuss that at office hour. So it's exciting to guide students through EE310. You're going to pick up circuit skills. You're gonna pick up critical thinking skills. You're gonna pick up mathematical tools, and I always capitalize that. Um, because I like to think of mathematics, as much as I love mathematics, mathematics are tools in our toolbox. Um, just like a plumber or an electrician has a toolbox full of tools, as an engineer, you'll have a toolbox full of those tools, and a lot of them will be mathematical tools. You're also gonna learn a lot of practical stuff in this class. We're gonna talk about radios, we're gonna talk about acoustics, we're going to talk about cars. Um, this is some of my favorite material in the curriculum because it lends itself to such wonderful examples, both in things that people make, um, like washing machines and cars and things like that, as well as just some um, very nice uh, mathematics and circuit skills. So I hope you're going to enjoy it just like I do. This class uses algebra and calculus. And you're probably good at solving equations by now. And in this class, as I mentioned, you're gonna use math like a carpenter uses tools. But the challenge in this class is for you to write the equations. Solving the equations is easy. But the engineering material that you pick up in this class um, and the engineering uh, maturity that you pick up in this class, it goes way beyond the specific material. This class and the exams require circuit analysis skills from EE210. And if it's been a while since you took EE210, you may find yourself lagging. Come to office hour for help. And also, you'll see that I'll give a lot of circuit analysis problems and make sure that you completely understand them. For example, um, I'm going to talk a lot about Ohm's law in this class. And in this class, you all understand Ohm's law up here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it down here so that you'll be able to use it um, just um, without even thinking. And I'm going to introduce topics that I call KVL on the fly and KCL on the fly which are just going to allow you to use KCL and KVL just very quickly and efficiently. So if you find yourself a little weak on that part of the circuit analysis, make sure to study up on it. Make sure to ask me. Um, I'll always be glad to help you with it. If this is a repeat for this class, ask yourself what didn't work. What was it that wasn't right? Was it your study habits? Did you need to study more? Did you need to study more efficiently? Um, did you fall behind for some reason? Um, did you come to office hour? 
um, I encourage you so strongly to come to Office Hour and let me help you. Um, did you come to Office Hour? Or, you know, do you just hate this stuff? Is this just not something you like to do? Um, pay attention to that if, it, if that's the way you feel about it. I want you to participate in office hours. Stop me, ask me questions. Um, question office hours will be interactive. I want you to know that your questions are not dumb. Chances are everybody is going to have the same question. And I don't care if your English is weak. I don't care if your voice is soft. If we're in our normal lecture environment, I just come to my students. I, I just walk over so that I can actually hear them. Um, and I'll never humiliate a student in front of the class or in office hour if we're doing it online. Um, I like to have fun in my office hour, but I will never humiliate a student. I want you to participate. I want you to ask those questions. I want to help you with this material. Some students absorb this course from the lectures and the lecture notes alone. Most supplement the lecture with the book or vice versa. I don't recommend using external websites if you're confused. A lot of those websites are excellent but really everything you need for this class is clearly described in your book and hopefully in the course notes and these lecture videos. If you go to another source, it may be a very good source, but you're gonna kind of have to wrap your, your head around what that professor is doing, what their nomenclature is, what topics they consider are important. And you have to get that before you can really understand um, uh, the material that you came looking for. I'd much rather you do it within the boundaries of the class because I think it'll be more efficient and hopefully more helpful. If you're struggling with the material, come to office hour. You don't have to have a specific question by any means. If you're having problems, I'll work with you and we'll sort them out. I'm pretty good at that. Um, I might ask you one or two questions just to kind of get a sense of where you are. And um, um, after that, we'll, we'll tackle um, the problem or the area where you need the help. Um, in normal office hour at SDSU, which we have in a conference room, yes, that was a little gray kitty's tail. Um, I work sometimes with students individually. Um, frequently we work in groups because everybody has the same question and it helps me learn your names and if you're new to SDSU you might find project partners at office hour. We always have a good time and if you're new to SDSU um, you might make some new friends who you may end up in senior design with, but we always have a good time and it's one of my favorite parts of this gig. Um, if I show you something and I feel you understand it, chances are I'll ask you to explain it to someone else. Office hour is a good time. People find it very useful. Please come and let me help you. Um, like I say, you don't have to have a specific question. Um, I'll often go around the room and usually about half the people will say, I'm just listening, Professor. If I come up with a question, I'll ask it. Great. That's just what I want. Each lecture in this class consists of about 10 to 20 handwritten sheets of notes that I'll, pre I'll present um, on my screen. And I'll also post the lecture notes so you have them. Um, bring them to class, mark them up during class. Um, some students feel that they learn better when the instructor works the problem individually on the board and does every step. Uh, and some, of the, some students like to take notes. Um, if this is you, and I understand this is the way some people learn, we all learn differently. But if this is you, consider another section of the course um, because I go through about 10 to 20 sheets of notes and I don't want you to be just madly writing material down. 
Um, so I give you the notes and the most successful students in my class sit there with the notes in front of them and they write little notes in the margins and little annotations, but mostly just um, listen. So do the homework. Um, I assign problems that I work myself with no assistance. And I only assign problems that I believe are relevant. Some students just copy the solutions off Chegg. It amazes me how many students get 100% on homework and then they fail the class. But the students that use the the students that use the solution manuals for homework often say that the exams seem tricky to them. But students that struggle with the homework and let it confuse and torment them say that the exams are straightforward and get A's and B's in my course. They also develop a lot of engineering maturity that they use in the future for problem solving. So don't waste your time copying solutions. Homework is only worth 10% in my class. Um, during the summer session, you're not even going to turn homework in, but you'll have to do it um, because that's what it's going to take to get through the exams. I never, I always encourage students, never use a pen to do your homework. Um, I'm an engineer. I don't even use pens unless I'm signing something at the bank. And I'm not even comfortable writing with a pencil if I don't have a big old fat eraser in front of me. Because I make lots of mistakes and I like to write even when I don't know what I'm doing. So I kind of go through erasers. Don't use a pen to do your homework. You're not creating a masterpiece. Um, definitely don't use a pen when you take an exam. Some students do that, um, but I certainly don't recommend it. So also, I want you to know that I've posted every exam that I've ever given. I maintain my own frat files. And I want you to work those old exams. I don't post solutions because I want you to work the exams on your own. And I want you to check your answers using multiple approaches. And in this class, you're going to see that I'm going to show you lots of different ways to get the answers to problems. and. If you get an answer, I don't want you to, to jump over to the solution and say, is it right? And then find that it isn't, and then look at the solution and go, oh yeah, I can do that. That doesn't help you. What I want you to do is look at your solution and say, do I think it's right? Well, if it really is right, then this resistor's current should be whatever, or if this is really right, I can solve the problem a different way and I got to get the same answer. When you do that, you'll find that working the exams um, in classes is, is not nearly as difficult. So I'll help you solve the problems on my old exams in office hour, but you won't get solutions. So don't even ask. Grading in this class is done purely on your score. And there are no exceptions to that. Um, if you have an issue with a quiz or an exam grade, um, what I want you to do is scan the exam and submit a written appeal to me. So it's a formal procedure. I do not um, review exams with students at office hour because that's it's not really efficient for the other students in office hour. So you need to file a written appeal with me, email it to me. And if I find that I've made some egregious error or some tabulation error, you'll get points. Um, more than likely, you probably won't. Um, I can't make accommodations for improvement in the class over the semester. I can't make accommodations for bombing a test or bombing the final. Sometimes students will say, well, I did really poorly on the first two exams, but look how well I did in the final. I deserve a better grade. Other students will say, um, look, look how 
well I did um, at the beginning of the class and I bombed the final or the opposite. And there's no, there are no accommodations for that. It's purely based on your score. So I would expect, um, especially during the six week summer session, I would expect to dedicate about six to eight hours per day to this class. Um, you wanna go through the video, you wanna go through, you wanna hang out in office hour, you want to go back and review the lecture notes, make sure you understand every little piece of those lecture notes. And then you want to work your homework and do problems. It's going to take about six to eight hours uh, per day for this class. So make sure you have that time and make sure they're six to eight really good hours, not hours when you're half asleep or really tired. I know that's so much easier for me to sit here and say that, but I hope that you'll try to do that. Um, I suspect that the students who are taking this for the second or maybe even the third time um, are nodding their heads now, and um, I hope they're uh, committing to that. Don't get behind in this class. It's extremely hard to recover, <clears throat> um, especially during the six week summer session. Make sure that you're on top of it every day. Um, because it's, it's just really hard to recover, even when the class is in a 16-week session. Cheating, read the comments on the syllabus. I take cheating very seriously in my class. Um, I prosecute the cases that I see with the university to the fullest extent that I can, <clears throat> and I don't give any leniency, and I always go for the maximum penalty for cheating. Don't cheat in my class. In this class, um, you will need a webcam because we are going to use Respondus Monitor. So you absolutely need that. Okay, that's the introduction to the class. Um, I hope you enjoy it. As I mentioned, this is some of the funnest material and just the most informative material. It's the basis of all your signal processing courses and I, I thoroughly enjoy teaching it, and I'm really glad you're in my class. Okay, let's get to the course material. <clears throat> Before we dive into Chapter 8, I want to give you a little bit of a technical introduction to EE310. Um, basically, I just want to show you the kind of cool problems that you can solve with what you're going to learn in this class. And I think you'll be really surprised to find how the differential equations that we use in this class describe things that are all around you. Um, they are in the shock absorbers on your car. They are in the clangs of the little um, of the little wind chimes that you hear around you. Um, they are in. They are everywhere. And I want to just give you a little bit of an introduction to that because those things that I see all around me are always reinforcing the EE310 knowledge. So I just want to get you thinking that way. So let's start off with something that happened a couple of years ago. My kids went up to the cabin and of course they didn't drain the pipes because if you don't drain the pipes in the winter, the pipes freeze. So here's the situation. We've got the cabin here, and then we've got the copper pipes in the in the cabin, and those copper pipes froze, and we had a lot of snow that year. So I call the plumber, and the plumber brings out a thing called a hot shot box, and it delivers DC current at only a half a volt so here's his hot shot box, hits a tool in his toolbox, and he plugs it into 120 volts, and it's got um, two big cables coming out of it, and the cables have big clips, kind of like the jumper cables that you use for starting a car, but very low voltage, only a half a volt. You could put your tongue across those clips and wouldn't hurt you. But the idea is that the high current from this box 
um, causes resistive heating in the copper pipe because copper doesn't have a lot of resistance, but it has some resistance. And so when you put that 30 amperes through this pipe, there's some IR loss and the copper pipe warms up and the, the ice inside it hopefully melts. So how does that hot shot box convert 120 volts AC from the wall outlet to a half a volt at 300 amperes? How does it do that? And what you're going to see in this class is all the weight in the hot shot box is a great big transformer. And what that transformer does is it converts the 120 volts AC down to a very, very uh, low voltage very efficiently. So um, what you'll see in the power part of this class is that the transformer is extremely efficient. So let's say I have 120 volts AC and one volt, I'm sorry, and one amp coming out of the power line here. Then I have about 120 watts. So now I'm going to have a half a volt here, but I'm also going to put out 120 um, watts. So that means I could have 240 amps. So you can see that this thing converts this energy very efficiently. Here you have lots of voltage and a little bit of current. Here you have a little bit of voltage and a lot of current, but the power is the same. You're going to learn about that in this class. But as I watched the plumber work on this thing, he connected the big, the big clips to the pipe and the power went on. And after a while, the, the pipes cleared and we started to get some water again. And when he removed the, the the clips, there were great big sparks, big sparks when the plumber disconnected the machine to the pipe. Really? There's only a half a volt here. Why were there great big sparks? I mean, for that matter, why are there big sparks when you jumpstart a car? and you connect and disconnect the jumper cables, which hopefully you disconnect and connect the last one down somewhere on the frame, not near the battery, because um, charging batteries produces hydrogen gas and blows people up. So why were there big sparks happening when the plumber disconnected the machine at the pipes? We're engineers, let's make a model. So we had a half a volt DC here, and those, those long cables had about 10 microhenries worth of inductance. They didn't have a lot of inductance because they're not wrapped around a core or anything, but they do have a magnetic field around them, and so we get a little bit of, an in, of inductance. It's about 10 microhenries. And then we have what I show as a switch, and the switch represents the plumber connecting and disconnecting those big clamp, those big um, um, clamps from the copper pipe. And you're going to see this switch a lot in this class. What this shows is here's my little piece of the switch, and at t equals zero, that switch opens. See how my little arrow is going to open that switch? So this represents the plumber. Um, disconnecting that cable. And now let's look at the pipe. Here's the pipe in the house. I put a little dashed line around it so I can call it the pipe. And the pipe has about 13 microhenries of inductance and it has about 1.7 milliohms. That's not a lot of resistance, but it's a little bit of resistance. So let's use our model now and let us let it tell us things. So the current at time equals zero minus, and this is another term you'll see a lot in this class. What this says is the current going through here 
um, right before I open the switch or at time equals zero minus, just a little bit before time equals zero, is equal to a half a volt divided by 0.0017 ohms. Because as you'll see later, at steady state, we have no voltage across our inductors. So this whole half a volt is going to end up across um, this, this resistor. And so I'm going to end up with 294 amperes in this circuit. And so while the switch is closed, my 294 amperes, if I use my power formula, which we'll also cover in this class, which is I squared R, or the current squared times the resistance, I'm putting 147 watts in this pipe. This pipe is dissipating 147 watts. Okay, well, that explains why the ice melted. But now let's use the formula from physics that describes an inductor any time, um, any circuit, any configuration. This is just a property of the magnetics. The voltage across an inductor is equal to L di dt, or the inductance times the derivative of the current with respect to time. Now we notice that if we open the switch here, we're going to cause the current to stop immediately. Remember, we had 294 amperes in this inductor, and we're going to stop that immediately. So di dt is going to be infinite. So the voltage across the inductor is L times infinity. That's infinity. And yep, that's what happens, except instead of the voltage going to infinity, it gets up to the point where it can arc through the air and then it discharges. So the high voltage across the inductance, the inductors, cause those sparks, even though the voltage was only a half a volt DC. And the same idea is used to make a spark in the spark plugs of your car. Your car has a 12 volt battery. How do you get a thousand volts into a spark plug? Where you're gonna find that you use L V equals L D I D T. Unfortunately, the same idea is responsible for injury and death when jump starting cars incorrectly. Um, remember, when you jump start a car, um, what you want to do is connect your, your wires, uh, connect one of the wires between the two terminals of the battery. Then you want to connect the third wire, I'm sorry, the, the next wire, you want to connect it so that the last connection, the connection that completes the circuit, is made down at, the ground, at a ground point well away from the battery. Because when those sparks occur, you don't want them anywhere near the battery. So I like this example because as I sat out there freezing cold, wondering whether um, I was going to have any water up there, I was thinking about EE310. And it was such a beautiful example of it that just, just rubbed it all in and just reminded me not only of the fundamentals of inductance and properties of inductors, but also just how cool this stuff is and how you can also do cool stuff with it, like make spark plugs and make cars run. Let's look at another example. So this is a bad drawing of an airplane, and it's flying over San Diego. And it's flying over KGB 101's uh, FM radio transmitter. So it's about 15,000 feet because it's going down into LA probably. And that means it's about three miles away from the tower. Now, that airplane has a navigation system, and one of the components of aircraft navigation is VOR. Um, it stands for something omnidirectional range, um, but it's a, 
it's a there's a radio transmitter and in this case I've drawn the one up in Julian and that aircraft is trying to listen to that radio transmitter from Julian and that's about 50 miles away and so KGB's frequency is about 101.5 megahertz and the VOR transmitter is at 108 megahertz. So in frequency, they are very close together. And the KGB tower is transmitting um, at a, a very high power level. It's putting out a lot of power, um, probably hundreds of watts. And the reason it's putting out a hundreds of watts is because the cars that it's transmitting to are going into little valleys and they're going behind buildings and they're going behind hills. And they also want to get that signal clear up to Fallbrook, which is, I don't know, 40 miles away from San Diego. So for a commercial radio station they blast out a lot of power because the more power they put out the more customers they can reach <clears throat> the more customers they can reach the more money they get for their advertisements <clears throat> so kgb here is putting out as much power as the fcc allows it to so However, this little transmitting station here in Julian is only putting out about 15 watts. Very, very weak signal. So this airplane is getting blasted by KGB, and it's only getting a tiny little signal from the, the navigation tower that's actually um, responsible for the safety of the passengers on that airplane. So what I do in class with this example is I find someone who has a very soft voice and I hand him or her the textbook of the class and I say, will you please read this passage to the class? And then I take out my horn. I'm a, I'm a grade B studio trombone player. I bring out my horn and I blow a little trombone solo. And as students, that trombone solo just wipes out that person talking because I really want to emphasize the point of how much stronger the radio signal from this uh, commercial station is than the actual navigation signal. Um, well, I know that signal strength received at, at any receiver is proportional to some constant divided by the square of the distance. It's a good formula because you can see that as distance goes up, the signal strength would go down, duh. So it looks like the right thing is in the denominator. And Kp is a constant that depends on a lot of things. Um, it depends on the terrain. It depends on um, the medium that it's transmitting through, etc. But the bottom line is if we say the media is the same because they're just going through the air, Let's look at the ratio of KGB's power to the VOR uh, station. VOR, VHF, omnidirectional range. VHF is the band that the 108 megahertz is in. And we find that KP cancels, and the power from the radio station is about 278 times stronger from the radio station than the our uh, navigation transmitter. So how can that aircraft hear the VOR station? How can that be safe for the passengers? We're engineers, let's make a model. Here's my aircraft antenna, and it's gonna go through this thing called a filter. And then after it goes through the filter, it's gonna go into the radio receiver, and then from the radio receiver, um, the navigation information will be extracted and it'll go to the little instrument display that the pilot sees. 
So this is what is in the aircraft, and this filter is actually part of the navigation radio. What I'm going to do to, is I'm going to look at this filter in a little more detail. The way we describe a filter is we have frequency on one axis and response on the other axis. When we get into chapter 14, you're going to see a lot of plots that look like this. And so this shows that the filter passes some frequencies, but it doesn't pass other frequencies. Let's take a look. Here's 108 megahertz, which is what this receiver is trying to receive from the transmitting station in Julian. So good, the, the VOR signal that has the navigation information gets through, but KGBFM gets filtered out. See that? It doesn't get filtered out all the way, but it gets down pretty far. So the reason that that aircraft can safely hear the navigation system uh, signal is because the filter in the radio receiver in the aircraft, it passes signals at 108 megahertz, but it rejects signals in the FM radio band at 101.5 megahertz. And you're gonna see a bunch of examples of this when we get into chapter 14 on frequency response. Let's look at another example. I like acoustics because I love music and I'm very interested in musical venues, whether they be sleazy bars with block walls or whether they be beautiful concert halls. But let's take a look at a somewhat simplified problem. I've got a sound source here and this could be me talking up at the podium and here's a listener at just some point in a room. And let's make a simple model for how the sound gets to that listener. The sound source, of course, there's going to be a direct path and it's going to go right through the air to that listener. And then let's say there's a big, strong reflection off a, off a wall. Um, and that signal is going to take a little bit longer of a path to get to the listener. And so it's going to be delayed a little bit. So a good, a good um, model of a sound is just a sine wave in the audio band. So for path one, the listener hears some amplitude times the cosine of 2 pi ft. Or in other words, they hear a sine wave. If you really want a pure sine wave, listen to a flute. It has less harmonics than any other instrument. It's the closest thing we can make to a sine wave. For path two, the listener is going to hear a similar signal, but you can see that it's delayed by this constant of tau. Um, or in other words, the difference between these two paths in time is tau seconds. So tau is the time difference between the two paths. So the listener hears both paths. They hear path one plus path two, so we add those two up. And so the signal that the listener gets is going to be a cosine two pi f t plus cosine two pi f t plus tau. Let's work with this cosine 2 pi f times t plus tau. So that's going to be cosine 2 pi f t plus 2 pi f tau. I just multiplied those out. Let's say that tau is equal to 1 over 2f. If tau is equal to 1 over 2f, then this term becomes pi. See? It becomes pi. And using trigonometric identities, I know that cosine 2 pi f t plus pi is just negative cosine 2 pi f t. So wow, look, the listener 
here's direct path, reflected path, they cancel out perfectly. The listener hears nothing at that particular frequency, which is related to the path difference. So let's look at the frequency response. Just like we did for the airplane, now we're in the audio band. So if the frequency of the sound is some other frequency than the one we just described, you hear um, you hear the sound, the sine wave pretty well. But if that sine wave has exactly that frequency, it just disappears. What if somebody actually played that note? What if you're listening to a music performance and your lead singer is just belting it out beautifully and just building the song up <clears throat> and then she gets to her money note at the end of that song. It's the note that just puts the whole song together and she rips it out. And from where you're sitting, it's this note. Well, the person sitting in that chair thinks that you really don't have a very good lead singer because when it came to the big note in the tune, she blew an air ball. And I've, I've been at intermissions where people in the audience have come up to me and said, hey, what's with your lead singer? She, when she got to that one place, man, she just went flat. I just couldn't hear anything. And I don't try to explain Laplace transforms to that person. Um, I just tell them that they had a bad seat and she actually nails that note every time. Now, in, I did this example using just trigonometric identities. And using trigonometric identities, I was kind of limited to having to have just one reflected path. When we get into chapter 15 and chapter 16 and we use Laplace transforms, we'll find that we can tackle much, much more complex and interesting um, problems. So that's just an introduction to EE310. Um, hopefully it gets you a little bit excited about mater this material. Uh, it certainly reminds me of why I enjoy it so much. We'll start off chapter eight by looking at a capacitor. And in this capacitor, you can see that I have a plus here, a minus here, and those are VC, and then I have a current. And what we're looking at is what's called the passive sign convention, which is described really nicely in the book. And what this tells me is how it doesn't tell me what the voltage actually is across the capacitor. What it tells me is just how I define the voltage across the capacitor. So the, the, if I ask you for what VC is, say, what is VC? You look at how it's defined and you say, ah, it's the voltage on the plus side minus the voltage on the minus side. And let's say VC is positive then that means if I put the red lead of a multimeter here and the black lead here, then I'd get a positive number on the meter. Let's say VC is a negative. Then I put the red lead here, I put the black lead here, I'd get a negative number. Or if I put the red lead, if VC is negative and I put the red lead here and the black lead here, I'd get a positive number on the meter. This concept confuses students. Sometimes when they see VC uh, in a problem defined this way, they'll think that it has something to do with the voltage being positive. It isn't. It's just the way it's defined. So go back and take a look at the passive sign convention. Make sure you understand that well. Capacitors store energy in their electric field. And the differential equation that describes a capacitor under any condition in any circuit is IC, the current, is equal to C dV dt. Now let's look at the inductor. And similarly, 
I'm using the passive sign convention. I have my plus here, my minus here for the voltage across the inductor, and the current is defined to go from plus to minus through the device. That's the passive sign convention. And the differential equation that describes the inductor is V sub L, where the voltage across the inductor is equal to L times di dt. Inductors are slightly different than capacitors in that they store energy in their magnetic field, not in their electric field. But the two components are the same because they both store energy. It's just here we're storing it in an electric field, here we're storing it in a mag magnetic field. In chapter 8 and 16, we're going to analyze the behavior of these. Chapter 8, we're going to do it using second order differential equations and techniques. And in chapter 16, we're going to do it with um, Laplace transforms. But all the problems are going to be kind of the same we're going to start with the circuit at steady state, meaning the voltages and currents are not changing with time. The way I like to think of steady state is di dt is zero. They're not changing with time. Um, dv dt is going to be zero. If the circuit is at steady state, d anything dt is equal to zero. The circuit is at steady state. Voltages and currents are not changing with time. And you'll see that we'll refer to this as the circuit behavior at time equals zero minus, meaning it's the behavior right before we make some change. So we're going to start with the circuit at steady state. Voltages and currents not changing with time. Then we're suddenly going to change the circuit topology at time equals zero. We're going to change a switch. We're going to apply a voltage. We're going to turn a current source on, something like that. And we will observe the voltages and the currents immediately after the switch changes. And we're going to see that we're going to get thuds. Um, what I like to do in class, I drop one of my juggling bean bags because sometimes the circuit goes thud and just, you know, we get the change and there's no overshoot or ringing or anything like that. Or we'll get a boing. And for a boing, I like to drop a little piece of copper pipe so you can hear it go bing because the boing is the musical tone that you get. Boing! See it die out? Boing! So um, we're going to work the mathematics of that, but what, what we're going to see is that for these systems, you're either going to get some sort of a monotonic response or you're going to get some response with overshoot. But after all that, what we call transient behavior occurs, the circuit is going to go back to steady state again after a long time. And again, d everything dt is zero. So again, circuit is relaxed. There's nothing going on. There might be some DC current and DC voltages because um, we're at steady state. They're just not changing. Then we're going to have some interruption. We're going to go blah. And then eventually the blah is going to settle out and we're going to be back at steady state. And we call that time equals infinity. That's kind of what this is about. We're going to do lots of problems with this. Now, capacitors and inductors are called energy storage elements. They don't dissipate any energy they can only store energy and the energy in a capacitor is equal to one half cv squared one half times the capacitance times the voltage across the capacitance squared of course the units are joules and the energy in an inductor is one half l 
I squared, or in other words, um, one half times the inductance times the current squared. Remember we said that capacitors store energy in their electric field. Well, that's why V is in this equation. I like to make equations make sense. I like all my equations um, to make intuitive sense to me. I want to look at what's in the denominator. I want to look at what's in the numerator. I want to look at what's multiplied, what's added. And you'll see me do that in this class. Um, I use my intuition to guide the mathematics. I want you to pick up those skills also as part of my class. The energy in the inductor, uh, one half Li squared. Well, the inductor stores energy in the magnetic field. Magnetic field comes from current. Kind of locks all this stuff together for me. Um, you might remember power is watts. That's joules per second. That's the rate of energy transfer. But this is just a little bucket of energy that we measure in joules. Let's look at the terminology associated with this stuff. We're going to have V at zero minus or I at zero minus. And this is the current or the voltage immediately before the switch is changed. In the book, it'll say the circuit has sat for a long time with the switched closed. That means the circuit came to steady state. D, D anything DT is equal to zero. And that's like right before we do this topology change at T equals zero. So we call that V at zero minus or I at zero minus. We then have V at zero plus or I at zero plus. And this is the current or the voltage immediately after the topology of the circuit has changed. So it's just on the other side of T equals zero. So we said that we have our steady state here. We have our insult, our and then eventually the settles out or the boing goes boing and goes away. And the voltages and currents at that time, we refer to them as um, V of infinity and I of infinity. So it's the current or voltage after all the transients have subsided. The book doesn't express what I call the rules, but this is something that I came up with that I found really helps, helps students, and it helps me too. Sometimes in EE310, a student will do a problem or two and they'll see some sort of pattern. And they'll say, oh, professor, you know, is this always the case? And I kind of usually have to tell them, well, not really. You know, you, it's, it works for those two problems, but no. But in the case of what I call the rules, capital R, these will always hold. You can take these rules to the bank in old people speak. So I also like to divide the rules. I like to have a verbal description of the rule. Um, that's for one half of the brain. I, don't, I can never remember which half, but I like to have an intuitive side of the rule. And then I like to have a mathematical side because as I mentioned, I trust my intuition when I'm doing engineering problems and I always, um, I, I use math to support the intuition or to get me across bridges where intuition will not let me calculate things. So I really rely on both um, columns of my little table here. So let's start off with the first rule. The inductor current cannot change instantaneously. So we, you'll hear me say that a lot as we're doing problems. You can't change the inductor current instantaneously, so, and then that will tell us information about the circuit. Um, you might say, um, is there a good reason for that? And yes, because the inductor current 
is related to the energy in the inductor. And you can't instantaneously move energy from one place to another. Can't happen. So that means that we can't change the inductor current instantaneously. So we can trace this statement right back to the basic physics of the device. But now let's give it an equation. The inductor current at zero plus is equal to the inductor current at zero minus. Or in other words, when the big um, topology change happened at t equals zero, the inductor current does not change. IL of zero plus after the change is equal to IL before the change. Verbal, mathematical. Somewhat similarly, the capacitor voltage cannot change instantaneously. We recall that the energy in a capacitor is, is related to the electric field, one half CV squared. And of course, the voltage across the capacitor is what creates the electric field. And so um, since we can't move energy from one place to another quickly, uh, we can't change the capacitor voltage quickly. Again, you'll see in problems, I'll say, so we got to t equals zero, and at t equals zero plus, you're going to see the capacitor voltage is the same as it was at t equals zero minus. That's this mathematical statement right here. Vc of zero plus is equal to Vc of zero minus. So here's a couple of cannots. Let's look at a couple of cans. The inductor voltage can change instantaneously. That means between t equals zero minus and t equals zero plus, yeah, you can change the inductor voltage. And what I show here mathematically is just the basic equation. V equals L di dt. Di dt um, can't be instantaneous because we say it can't. I'm sorry. The current cannot change instantaneously, but the derivative of the current can. See that? So inductor voltage can change instantaneously. Similarly, the capacitor current, it can change instantaneously. So between t equals zero minus and t equals zero plus, yeah, that capacitor current can totally change. And again, I just show the equation for that. Now let's look at steady state. And as I mentioned for these problems, there are two steady state points. One is at t equals zero minus. That's where the circuit has had a long time to settle and you're getting ready to insult it somehow. And the second steady state condition is time equals infinity. You had your thud or you had your boing and everything settled out and you got back to steady state. So here are some rules for steady state. At steady state, we know that di dt equals zero. Um, d anything dt is zero because the circuit is at steady state. So that means the inductor voltage is equal to zero. Because remember, V equals L di dt. Here it is. If di dt is zero, of course, V is equal to zero. So V infinity equals zero. Um, another nice way to say this rule is at steady state, there's no voltage across the inductor. Really helps you triage circuits. Our last rule, at steady state, since d anything dt is equal to zero, um, the current in the capacitor is equal to zero. Let's go back to our basic equation. It's right here. If dv dt is zero, then of course ic equals zero. So when we look at a capacitor at steady state, it will have no current through it. I know some of you like to draw that by showing the little terminals going down and then going nowhere. And that's totally cool. That totally works. But I want this to be so deeply ingrained that you don't even need to do that. You look at that capacitor, you jump to 
the rules and you apply it. So these rules, I am going to go back to these in every single um, chapter that we work in, likely in almost every single lecture, I'll go back and appeal to the rules. So make sure you know them in your head, make sure you know them in your heart, and they'll really help you with these problems. Let's do an example. So in this example, um, I'm stating it the way the book states it, which is that the switch has been closed for a long time and it opens at t equals zero. Here's the switch. It's been closed for a long time and it opens at t equals zero. Now that's a lot of words. In the problems and the exam, all you're going to get is this picture, meaning it opens at t equals zero. If the arrow went the other way, it closed at t equals zero. But in this case, it opens at t equals zero. So let's compute di in the current di sub l dt and vl of infinity. So I asked for dil dt, so I better show it on the schematic. And I'd better show the arrow, the direction of it, or in other words, the convention. And so you can see here, I was very careful about that. I said, here's V sub L plus to minus, and here's I sub L flowing this way. So that's the convention we're going to use because I showed it. And similarly, I'm showing IR and um, and VR. So let's do um, what I call just triaging the circuit. And you're going to hear that term a lot. I love that term. Um, it's actually a medical term. And when a patient comes into an emergency room, they usually have a triage nurse who looks at them to see how badly banged up they are. And in other words, um, how urgently they need help. And I actually had a trauma where I was leading my Boy Scouts in a cave and I fell down a shaft in a cave and um, ended up collapsing a lung. And when I finally ended up in the emergency room, the triage nurse uh, listened and didn't hear any lung sounds and said, do you need to call anybody because you're going to go into surgery to get your lung inflated? So. She gave me a triage and said, you're not, <laughs> you're not going out into the waiting room. Um, so one thing this tells you is if you get stuck waiting for a long time in the waiting room at the emergency room, that's a good thing. That means that you're not busted up very badly. But I like to triage circuits and I do it for a couple of reasons. One is because I want to get my arms all the way around the circuit so that I can really understand it. And for students, the reason I want you to do it is because once you've triaged it and you kind of know what's going on, you're not afraid of it anymore and you relax and then you do better on the exam. So let's triage this circuit. So what do I see? I see one amp here. Here's a current source. And at T equals zero minus, this current is flowing here, and let's see. I know that there's no steady state voltage across the inductor because that's one of my rules, or I can just say V equals L di dt, and because di dt is zero, the voltage is going to be zero, but it's easier for me to use the intuitive um, argument on that side of the, um, of the table and say, no voltage across here, so that means the current at time equals zero minus is going to be going this way, and it's going to be one amp. Now I'm going to open the switch, and boy, that's not going to make the current source very happy, but I'm just not going to worry about that for now. So I open the switch, 
and I'm going to go to my rule that says I can't change the inductor current quickly. That means at T equals zero plus, I'm still going to have one amp going through this inductor this way. It's not coming from here, but it's got to come from somewhere. So it's going to suck it out of this resistor here. So that means at T equals zero plus, I'm going to all of a sudden get a current going that way through my resistor because that, in, that current is going to go through the inductor. It's going to be one amp, and that means the voltage at the resistor at time equals zero plus is going to be start at zero, go down. 2 ohms times 1 amp is going to be minus 2 volts. So that's kind of cool. Um, at T equals 0, we had no voltage here, so we had no current here. And at T equals 0 plus, I get negative 1 amp through here, and I get minus 2 volts here. Hey, that changes the voltage across the inductor quickly. But that's one of my rules. I can change the voltage across the inductor quickly. So I think I understand this. I'm happy with this. So let's see what we're asking. I want di dt at zero plus. So when the switch opens, I sub L at zero plus is going to be equal to I of L of zero minus. That's on the right side of our table. So IR, the current in the resistor at zero plus, is equal to negative one amp. And yes, I'm getting bothered by a cap. So the voltage at the resistor at time equals zero plus is going to be negative two volts. And you're going to hear me say this term a lot. Um, I'm going to say KVL on the fly. And Actually, I'm going to introduce that uh, later. So VL at zero plus is going to be negative two volts because I've got a current of one amp going this way. I'm zero volts here. That's going to make me negative two volts here. So since VL equals LDI dt, we're going to say that DI LDT is equal to V sub L divided by L. We're just rearranging this equation. We put in the terms, and I get minus two-thirds amps per second. And so that's DIL dt. I always like to look at graphs of things to make sure things make sense. Here's the current in the inductor. And it starts off at one amp. And look, I'm drawing t equals zero minus here. This is right before that switch uh, opened up. So here's t equals zero minus. Here's t equals zero plus. At t equals zero plus, the inductance, I'm sorry, the current doesn't change, but the derivative changed, and here it is. It's minus 0.66 amps per second. So that's the slope at this point right here. Okay, now let's look at t equals infinity. At t equals infinity, I know that the steady state uh, voltage across the inductor is going to be zero. Therefore, the voltage across the resistor is zero. So I got no current in the resistor. I got no current going this way because the switch is open, so I got no current in the inductor. And so we're asked for the voltage at the resistor, sorry, the voltage at the inductor at time equals infinity, that is going to be zero. So this is a good time to talk about KVL and KCL quote on the fly. This is just something I started using in my lectures a few years ago. Um, coming from 210, you've done a lot of circuits that had nice rectangular meshes like this one, and they had nice nodes like this one. And 
you solved problems by summing all the currents at a node to zero or all the voltages around a loop to zero. And you did, you would write the equations and then you would solve them. And that is exactly what we're doing with KVL on the fly, for example. But for KVL on the fly, I will say things like start at zero. Here's my little ground symbol that, that always means the zero reference for the circuit. So let's say we have this current of one amp going this way through the two ohm resistor. I'll say start at zero, go down two ohms times one amp. That puts you at negative one volt here. I'm using KVL on the fly in Ohm's law, but I'm just doing it very quickly and efficiently. Start at zero, go down one amp times two ohms. I'm at negative two volts here. You might have noticed that I also used KCL on the fly in the last problem. When I said uh, at T equals infinity, I said, well, we have no voltage here, so I got no current here because I got no voltage across it. I got no current here because the switch is open. That means I got to have no current here. That's just KCL on the fly. If you wanted, you could say zero plus zero plus I equals zero. That's great, but it takes too long. Use your intuition. I got no current here because I know there's no voltage across the resistor. I got no current here. Therefore, I got to have no current here, and I save myself a lot of time. So I refer to that as KVL and KCL just on the fly. Uh, it helps me a lot. It's helped a lot of students, and I'm hoping it's going to help you also. Let's do another example. So in this example, I'm introducing a little bit more terminology. Um, Here's my little symbol for ground, and this shows the zero point in the circuit. And here I show VA. I'm calling this node A. So the voltage here is VA. And what you don't see is VA plus minus. What you see is just VA. And the implication of that is that is the voltage at this point with respect to ground. So you want to kind of get used to that. The book uses that notation. I use that notation. Um, circuit um, schematics that you see in industry will use that notation. If you don't specifically see um, your, if you don't specifically see um, the plus and minus terminals or whatever, it means you're asked for this voltage with respect to ground. Uh, you notice here I said VC and I specifically said what VC refers to. It's the voltage here minus the voltage here. So that's the first little piece of terminology. Now, what you're tempted to do when you see these kinds of problems is say, what am I asked for? It's a natural thing. You look at the circuit and go, yeah, yeah, yeah that's nice. Okay, what's he asking for? But what you're going to find with these circuits is that you're really, that if you understand the circuit, it doesn't matter what you're asked for. And conversely, if you don't really understand the circuit, um, you're not going to be able to get what is asked for. So what I don't want you to do with a problem like this is say, oh, let's see, I got to get this, I got to get this, I got to get that. Okay, what is it? I don't want you to do that. I want you to triage it. Let's triage. Uh, what do we got? <clears throat> so let's see, I got a a fixed voltage source here, plus to minus. Okay, it's on all the time. Here's three volt source, it's on all the time. I got a switch, and I'm gonna interpret this to mean the switch has been closed for a long time and it opens at T equals zero. So 
at t equals zero minus, I'm gonna have, let's see, zero minus is steady state. So I got no voltage across here, right? So that means there's no voltage across here, no current in this resistor, but also let's use KVL on the fly. Six volts, go down no volts, I got six volts here. Switch is closed, I got six volts here at T equals zero minus. Let's keep using the rules. So if I have six volts here and I got zero volts here, I have six divided by three ohms. That means I'm gonna have two amps here. Okay, here, my rule tells me that I have no current through this capacitor. So um, that also helped me um, just before, because I, I didn't actually mention that KCL on the fly, no, actually, I'm sorry, I said I had six volts here. That means I got two amps here, period. Now, one of our rules says we can't have any current through this inductor at steady state. So that means no current. Hmm, okay, so let's use KVL on the fly and figure out what's going on here. If I got no current here, I have no current here. So that means I have no current through the resistor, which means I have no voltage drop. So let's use KVL on the fly. Start at three. No current, so no voltage drop, so I'm still at three. Okay, so at T equals zero minus, I got three volts here. I got six volts here at zero minus, so that means VC at zero minus is going to be six minus three is gonna be three volts. Okay, so that's zero minus, I'm, I'm happy with that. And I can easily go back and get those numbers when I get down to the nitty gritty. So when the switch opens, what do I know? I know that I can't change the voltage, um, I can't change the current through this inductor quickly. So I open the switch, this current is gonna stay the same. So that means I'm not going to have any current going this way. I'm going to have, um, let's see, six divided by three, two amps going this way. And that means two amps, no amps, two amps going this way. So that means two amps times one ohm. I'm going to have two volts from here to here at T equals zero plus. Go back to the rules. I can change the inductor voltage quickly. Yep, went from zero to two volts. Okay, so that's what's going on there. Now let's look here. So I, I have three volts across this capacitor. So if I wanna get the current through the capacitor at T equals zero plus, which I know can change instantaneously because that's one of my rules, I need to use KVL. And this is a little too complicated for KVL on the fly, so I'm gonna actually write the equation. But bottom line is it's gonna get me the current through this capacitor, and from that I can get dV dt. So, okay, I can get all this stuff. Now let's look at T equals infinity. We're still triaging. At T equals infinity, um, I know that I'm going to have no voltage across this inductor. I also know that since there's no voltage across the inductor, there's no voltage across the resistor. That means I got no current here. So let's see. At T equals infinity, since I have no voltage across the inductor, I have six volts here. Now, can you work problems different ways? You bet. We just said we have no current in the resistor. So let's use KVL on the fly. Six minus zero times one gives us six. We got the answer two ways. One way by saying there was no voltage drop across an inductor at steady state. 
The second way was we said, well, we showed we had no current through this resistor, so there's obviously no voltage drop, so that means if I have six volts here, I got six volts here. All right, so that's this side of the circuit at T equals infinity. Now let's look at this side of the circuit at T equals infinity. So this is obviously disconnected, so I'm not going to worry about it. And I know that there's no current in the capacitor. So let's see. That means there's no current here and there's no current here. So that means using KVL on the fly, I have three minus zero times five means I got three here. And I've got no current here, no current here. So KCL on the fly tells me I got no current here. So that means at time equals infinity, I'm going to have three volts on this end, and I'm going to have zero volts on this end. So by the way I've defined the capacitor voltage, I'm going to have zero minus a, I'm sorry, um, zero minus, sorry, I goofed that again. I've got three volts here. I've got zero volts here. Zero minus three means I have negative three volts across the capacitor. It took me a couple of times to get that one right. Um, so I totally understand this problem now. And you might have thought that I wasted a lot of time with that triage, but you're going to find that now the calculations are going to be really simple because we know what we're doing and also, my stress level went down, because I know what I'm doing. So let's see, I sub L of zero minus. At T equals zero minus, I know that I have no voltage drop across here. And that means I have six volts here, so I have six volts here. And let's see, I have six divided by three is two amps here no amps here because no steady state current in a capacitor. So that means two amps here, two amps here. At I sub L of zero minus, I have two amps through the inductor. What's VA at zero minus? I have no voltage drop across the inductor. So that means I got six volts, six volts here, six volts here. I can also say I have no voltage across the inductor at steady state. So that means I have no voltage across this resistor. So KVL on the fly says six minus zero times one is six. VA at zero minus is six volts. We just did it two ways. VC at zero minus. Um, VC at zero minus we go back to our convention and say, it's gonna be the voltage on this end minus the voltage on this end. At zero minus, I have six volts here. I have, since I have no current, I have three volts here, three volts here. Six minus three is three. So now I sub L at zero plus, that's easy. Our rule says that I sub L of zero plus is equal to I sub L at zero minus is equal to two amps, done. VC at zero plus is going to be equal by our rule to VC at zero minus equals three volts. Um, VC zero minus is three volts, VC zero plus is three volts. Now I want IC at zero plus. And I know how to do it because I know that I have no current here and I know what the voltage here is at zero plus. So I need to just write a mesh equation because it's too hard for me to do this one in my head. So here we go. Here's our circuit. I'm gonna say IC is my unknown. So I'm gonna go three times IC plus this voltage drop, plus three, see it taking shape over here, plus five IC plus three equals zero, and I get IC 
is equal to 0.75 amps. Now, let's get VA at zero plus. And that's another kind of hard one. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that at zero plus, the current through the capacitor is the same as the current um, through the resistor. And the current through the capacitor was minus 0.75 amps. Now, what that means is the actual current is flowing this way. It's flowing right to left. And so when that goes through my three ohms, I'm going to get 0.75 amps times 3. And that's going to be 2.25 volts. Now, I want you to really make sure you're good with the signs here, because that shows that you're understanding the passive sign convention. The current is defined as going this way. And therefore, um, I see, and we calculated I see to be negative, meaning the actual current's going this way. So, 0.75 amps times 3 ohms, 2.25 volts. Good time to turn the uh, recording off. Make sure you're good with that. Now we want to find dVc dt. We want to find the derivative um, of Vc with respect to time at t equals 0. Remember in our last problem, we said, oh, that's the slope at t equals 0 plus of this curve. Um, this is for a current, but this one's for a voltage, but it's the same idea. We know that I equals C dV dt. So dV is equal to I over C. Well, we know that I is 0.7, negative 0.75 over 1. So dVc dt is equal to minus 0.75 volts per second. I'm a terrible joke teller, but there's an old joke about um, a person has a, some sort of plumbing problem and their pipes don't work just right, they have a leak or whatever. They call a plumber and the plumber comes out and plumber kind of looks and plumber listens and plumber smells and plumber kind of feels things and temperatures on pipes, stuff like that goes out and gets a big rusty screwdriver out of his truck and takes the screwdriver, comes in and goes and turns something a little bit and the leak stops. And then the plumber charges $250. And the homeowner says, hey, wait a minute, all you did is just turn that little screw. You can't charge me $250 for that. The plumber said, I didn't charge you $250 to turn the screw. I charged you $250 for my knowledge of knowing which screw to turn and how far to turn it. And that stupid joke is actually relevant here because what you saw, we started this lecture with six or seven rules. And I gave you an intuitive description of the rule and a mathematical description of the rule. And you looked at the rules and you went, yeah, that makes sense. That's pretty easy. But where it gets difficult is knowing how and when to apply the rules. And that's one of the most difficult things in EE310. Um, so I've given you some examples <clears throat> where we actually used the rules and calculated a bunch of stuff. And you have a bunch more homework problems um, that will do the same thing. So I really want to acknowledge that this is not easy stuff. The rules look easy. Applying them um, definitely takes some learning. So give this lecture a good uh, listen through. And uh, please don't get behind in this material. And we will see you at the next lecture and hopefully at office hours.